All right, so our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. When I first saw this quote, I thought to myself, wow, that's, that's a big challenge. But then I was actually surprised by my second reaction, which was, exactly, who am I not to be? You see, I grew up in a generation where I was always told that I would be great and that I would do things that were so amazing that they would actually change the world. I grew up in a generation where I had elevated my perceived status to a level where I expected myself to be so great that I would indeed be powerful beyond measure. <clears throat> so I read those three words again, powerful beyond measure. Read those. Pretty powerful, right? It means that we will go on to do things that are so amazing, so incredible, that it's beyond our capacity to be able to even understand how much of an, of an impact that we're making. It goes beyond the scope of any expert. It means that we're creating a new scale by which things were measured. So I read it a final time, and my final reaction was, bring it on. <laughs> Yet I'm not the only one with this ostentatious view. I'm constantly surrounded by other people my age, particularly those people in this room, who want to do more than just create a job for themselves. They want to do more than just provide for their families. They actually want to go out and make a difference in the world um, and have fun while doing it. Um, and this isn't happening just in the United States, but it's happening all around the world. And so the struggle really is, what do we do with this energy? So I want everybody to um, think back to that one point in their life, that one event, that one person, that one moment of inspiration that was the spark of motivation for you doing what you're doing today. For me, one of those first moments was when I was a senior in college. Um, I had just moved to Washington, D.C. to start a four-month internship with a big four accounting firm. Um, and so I was told that it was an amazing opportunity, a great chance to get in the door of a great organization that maybe would one day give me a job. So I spent the next four months creating green and red tick marks on an Excel spreadsheet and balancing bank statements and examining expenses to make sure that they were actually legitimate expenses. It was a ton of fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after four months, the internship director called me into her office and she said, congratulations, Sarah, great job. We would love to offer you a job once you graduate. And my heart sank because I thought about myself in the next year, grossly overweight because of all of the Milky Ways I would have to eat just to get through the day. <laughs> and I said, I smiled and I thanked her and I said, I'll have to think about it. Thank you very much. So as I left the office on H Street and I walked down the street, I couldn't help but feel guilty because I didn't feel elated with this promise of a job offer. Um, and I thought back to some of my other graduating peers who not only were graduating without a job offer, but weren't even graduating with the promise of a job offer. So that I did the only thing I knew to do. I called my dad and I relayed the great news. And he said, congratulations, Sarah, you deserve a great job. But is this really the direction that you want your career to be headed? And I said, no. And he said, well, you know, we trust the decision that you're going to make, but just know that we are here to support you whatever decision you make. So I said, okay, well, when you can't make a decision, my reaction is to delay. So I asked for an extension on the decision. I went back to school to finish the semester. So every year, um, the school that I attended organizes a CEO lecture, where a CEO from a top organization comes in and, and lectures us future business leaders on what it's like to be a great CEO of a great organization. So spring 2009, the CEO that came in to speak was the CEO of Krispy Kreme, Jim Morgan. Uh, has everybody heard of Krispy Kreme? All right. <laughs> Better than Dunkin' Donuts, right? Um, okay, so he said something to me that day that completely changed my perspective on life. He said, passion is easy. You feel it. It's internal. You know whether you're in the right spot. You'll know how excited you are about going to work. You'll know how excited you are about the people that you're going to work with. You'll know how proud you are of the platform and what it's accomplishing. You'll know if you have a passion for it. He then went on to say, in my opinion, if you're pursuing a career about which you have no passion, you're either pursuing someone else's dream or someone else's dream for you. That was it. I knew I couldn't take the job because I was stealing someone else's dream job, which I just couldn't be responsible for. So I went home, I wrote an email to my dad entitled The Plan, which I still have, that outlined the next six months of my life, some of which may or may not have included sleeping on a couch. And I called the internship director and I said, thank you, I'm very honored to have this opportunity, but unfortunately I can't take the position. 
I then went immediately to cheaptickets.com and bought a one-way ticket to Entebbe, Uganda. What I didn't know then is that I would spend the next four months having the most incredible time of my life and finalizing those final pieces of what would then become my life's mission. I left empowered, I left invigorated, I left with this sense that I would do something so miraculous that it would change the world. I knew that by the end of those four months, I would have given everyone the tools and opportunities that they needed to succeed, and in essence, I will have solved poverty in Uganda in just four months. <laughs> So after 26 hours of flying, my now friend, great friend Martin, and his little niece Chelsea picked me up from the airport um, amidst somewhat chaotic experience, but he finally did arrive to pick me up. Um, and then a few days later, I started a program called the African Young Entrepreneurs, where I had a group of 40 of my peers um, that all came together because they saw entrepreneurship as their ticket to not only do what they were passionate about, but be able to provide for themselves and for their families. Um, so I could tell you a lot of stories about third degree burns, about motorcycle accidents, about orphans in Rakai, about jumping into Crater Lakes, or about bungee jumping into the Nile River. But instead, I want to share with you some of my learning lessons um, that I got during my experience, but then also share with you what I feel like our role as leaders and as entrepreneurs is um, in, in continuing this legacy. Um, so here are a couple of my friends, also some of the most amazing people that I've ever met. Um, so if, how many of you have been to East Africa? I think I see two hands. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so the most, most important thing for building this basis is really understanding and appreciating existing culture. Um, so when I came in, I came in with a ton of ideas, and what I learned is that you really just have to wash off, come in with a blank, blank slate, blank template, um, and really listen and understand. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that everybody has different levels of risk tolerance. Um, so this can be either attributed to genetics, um, but then also to the environment in which we were raised. Um, so, uh, so we spent the first two weeks doing innovation and idea creation exercises. Um, and I was absolutely blown away by the ideas that they were coming up with. They were innovative, they were revolutionary, um, and they were indeed things that would change the, the shape of, of culture in Kampala. And I was so excited. And so at the end of those two weeks, as we ran around, went around the room and everyone's detailing and talking about what ideas they finally chose, I was completely blown away and surprised because the ideas that they were telling me were not the ideas that we had talked about for the past two weeks. And I didn't understand. And so I, I left that day feeling very discouraged and very demotivated because I, be, and I began to question why I was there. So for those of you that raised your hands that have been to East Africa, do you know what this is? Matoke, yes. Okay, matoke are plantains. So it's a staple, a staple dish in, in East Africa and Uganda. Um, the other thing is that people will use whatever they have to be able to heat their food. So that could be a stove, or it could be burning a tire, or it could be burning trash. So um, one of my students in my class, Yvonne, had actually come up with a way to use these discarded matoke peels, which are lining the roads because everybody's eating matoke, um, and it may actually make them into a charcoal briquette that was a clean burning source of fuel to be able to heat your food. So I, I ran into Yvonne on, on my way home and I said, Yvonne, you know, you've, you're incredibly passionate about this, this briquette that you've created. Why are you not going after this idea? And he said something that completely changed my view of why I was there. He said, Sarah, if I make these bricks and nobody buys them, not only can I no longer provide for my family, but my parents will be so ashamed of me but that they'll have to kick me out of my house. And once I'm kicked out of my house, my community will then shun me. And I realized that I had come in with a completely egocentrical view. I didn't come in trying to understand where they were in their lives. I, I heard where they were, but I didn't actually listen. Um, and so I then resolved that you know, my role there was not to come in and maybe spread the most innovative or the most scalable ideas, because that's not what would work, at least not yet. What we had to do first was instill this culture of entrepreneurship. Um, so putting, putting forward the, the platform of what it means to be a culture of entrepreneurship, we have to listen first, um, help understand what their passions are, 
um, what their strengths are, and then what different problems are in the, in the, in the community. Um, and then try and innovate with them to find where you can pair those passions and those problems to actually come up with different solutions. And then comes in the encouragement and the experimentation aspects of pushing yourself a little bit more and a little bit more every day with each new success that you have. But then I think the really big part is then building the community around all of these elements so that if and when you fail, your community is there to support you as well. So then continuing to dare to try, to try harder, to try again, to fail, to try again. Um, but then the other element is also using the connections that I had to then provide different funding opportunities so that those financial risks were not as much of a burden. <clears throat> so then came the part of, of what I like to call activating the miracle of community. So in, in facilitating this enterprise development, um, the activation of the community is actually the most important part. And so I'm going to tell you three steps in just a minute. But um, the, this is one of my favorite quotes, which is, the miracle of the intelligence of the local people is such that you can change the culture and the economy just by capturing the passion, energy, and imagination of your own people. Um, I think that's really powerful, especially here, because you can really see that going on in this community. Um, you really see the passion, you really see the energy, and you really see it all really being built out um, together. <clears throat> um, so the first, the first thing in, in activating community, the first thing is to sit and listen. Don't come in with ideas. Um, un try and understand people where they are, understand their history, understand what's worked in the past and what hasn't worked in the past, and understand why it has or has not worked. Um, the second thing is to wait. Um, when, when talking about whether creativity or knowledge is more important, I actually think the most important thing is passion. We can share ideas with people all day long, but at the end of the day, if they're not passionate about that idea, they're not going to do anything about it. Um, one of my favorite examples is with these extreme entrepreneurship tour events that we do. Um, after we do some idea generation exercises, we ask people to then share their ideas. And I'm always so surprised at how many people refuse to share their ideas because they're afraid someone's going to steal it. Um, and so to this day, I still don't know of anyone that's ever stolen anybody's idea because they're either not passionate about it, they're not passionate about the problem, or they have their own good idea. So they really don't need it. Um, and then the second thing is to become part of the community. Um, you know, economic development really isn't a band-aid short-term short -term solution. Um, it's all about uh, implementing different different parts within the community, activating it, um, and then slowly seeing what it happens and instilling that within the community. Um, so once, once this can, entrepreneurship can then become something more than just a young person creating his or her own job. Um, it can then become something that that um, is more is uh, can give people the responsibility, the opportunity to become globally minded, socially responsible young people, who then um, have the passion to innovate, to do something that's different, to do something that's innovative, um, and to do something that's going to really make uh, a difference in the world, um, make a posit positive impact in their lives, and truly allow them to live lives of passion, purpose, and prosperity. Thank you. Uh, Three questions? Yes. What drew you to UCI? That's a great question that unfortunately I can't answer. <laughs> um, I, I knew I, I'd always wanted to go to East Africa. Um, and, and I think Entebbe was just the cheapest ticket. <laughs> yes. Um, a brief comment first. What bored me about your presentation is Similarity in terms of your, your passion of uh, Peace Corps volunteers like me 30 years ago. Um, yeah. But looking at the experience of the current day Peace Corps volunteers with the connectivity and social media and everything else, the experience is very different. Mm. But um, so I guess I'll form this in, in, in terms of a question. I, I, uh, wouldn't you agree that um, connecting with current Peace Corps volunteers in the field with this kind of uh, and return volunteers with all of their um, with all their experience, with this kind of entrepreneurial passion, could be a really powerful accommodation. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll suggest two portals you might want to look at. That okay. Have the same uh, webmaster essentially. One's called Africa Rural Connect. Okay. And the other one's called um, um, 
Peace Corps, uh, well, it, Peace Corps Connect. Okay. PeaceCorpsConnect.org connects 30,000 return volunteers. Uh, they're trying to connect all quarter million. Wow. Um, the the uh, Mali from Mali, and Mali's, the country of Mali is obviously a very intense kind of mm -hmm. situation, uh, is, is a friend of mine, and she runs After Rural Connect. And, uh, and the, the National Peace Corps Association is a 501c3, um, which is relatively small, but basically has some really, I think one of the issues in the Peace Corps right now is the entrepreneurial side of it, dealing with the, with the bureaucracy. So yeah. I'm, I'm just going to offer that to you. Cool. And, and I think it would be an amazing connection. Yeah, I'd love to connect with you after and maybe get your sure. business card. Yeah. Yes. So did you actually see entrepreneurial projects that you know started up in this particular community <coughs> yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Um, so Ivan actually did go on to create his briquettes. Um, Martin, who I mentioned at the beginning, um, started a tourism company about two years ago. Um, another group of girls started a um, an academy for fine arts, um, so like teaching music lessons and dance and theater. Um, and then another group um, is making um, handmade jewelry, but in a different way. So they're actually exporting it to the Western world um, instead of just the, um, oops, sorry. Um, instead of, I, since you've been there, you know, like the, the newspaper um, necklaces and stuff like that. So, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you very much.